Welcome back. I'm that chemist, and today we have a story where someone was rushed to the hospital because they injected themselves with an EpiPen. I have a friend who permanently lost feeling in two fingers because of dry ice. They were doing some kind of demonstration as a part of a theater group, I think, or maybe a science thing for some kids, and it involved a container full of dry ice. Well, a piece of dry ice fell out of the container somehow, and a kid was about to grab it, so my friend snatched it up before the kid could. They balanced it on their ring and pinky fingers while moving it towards the container to put it back in, and ever since then, those two fingers haven't been able to feel anything except cold. Definitely a good thing they did that, though, since otherwise the kid would have possibly gotten some nasty cold burns. So dry ice can actually be quite severe. I've personally got frostbite when working with dry ice before. There's usually two different ways you can get dry ice. You can get it in the solid pellet form or block form, but there's a third way that is less common. And so you can get a cylinder of CO2, that's a liquid withdrawal cylinder, and it'll actually blow the CO2 into a brick. And the brick is really fluffy and light. So personally, I think the bricks of CO2 that you make from a cylinder are the best because they're fluffier, they're lighter, and you're less likely to immediately get frostbite from them. Now the solid chunks of dry ice are a lot more dangerous because they're denser. And so in this case, I'm assuming that they were working with the pellets or one of the big blocks that are like the pellets. You have to be really careful when you're working with dry ice and you're supposed to wear thick, well-insulated gloves to protect your fingers from any possible burns. I dated a girl who worked in a lab that was doing experiments with H1N1. She had super shaky hands and we often joked about her spraying H1N1 all over herself on accident. Well, one day when she was syringing stuff into about 100 containers, she managed to slip and stab herself with a needle. She called me, freaking out that she just shot herself in the finger with H1N1. I had her go to her supervisor immediately and got her calmed down, and after a minute or so, she realized that it was only H1. From what I understand, the lab was doing something involving the H1 part of the flu. This is one of the labs that was working on alternative vaccinations for the flu, plant-based and stuff like that. I talked to the supervisor later and learned that the procedures were set up so that any syringe work done by humans was done with relatively harmless chemicals and the more dangerous stuff was done by the fancy pipette robot. I was still weirded out that she got H1 injected, but apparently the solvent was non-toxic and her body would just filter out what was in there with no side effects. She also only got a very tiny amount injected. So I'd be interested to know if any of you have expertise and you have anything to comment on this, because this would still be super freaky to me. So I actually got swine flu when I was a young kid. I was at a sports camp which was like a week-long event. And I remember one night we were in a dorm full of students and it got really humid overnight, like super, super humid. You can imagine like eight guys in this little cabin sweating all night. It was closed. There was no ventilation. And I woke up with the worst sore throat ever. And there was like a thick layer of condensation and sweat on the window inside the cabin. And it was disgusting. When I got back from camp, I was clearly sick. I wasn't sure whether it was a cold or a flu, but then I got the worst backache I've ever had in my life, and I had a multi-week long backache that felt like I needed to crack my back, and there's nothing I could do about it. All I could do is lay in bed and still be in pain, but eventually I got better with no other side effects. Phenol is much more hazardous than most people seem to think. My friend used to work at a plant where they make phenol formaldehyde resins. They take delivery of phenol via rail car tanks of 20,000 gallons. Getting the phenol out of the tank requires melting it with a steam heated wand. This process is done by a team of two workers in head to toe PPE. One who melts the phenol, and one who stands by in case the phenol overheats and burps out of the tank onto the guy doing the melting. If that happens, worker number two is to grab worker number one by the collar, throw him into the safety shower, and call for an ambulance. Pretty much everyone agrees that worker one is toast at that point anyway. Skin exposure over 25% of the body is potentially fatal. I think if they can sort out robots for pipetting toxic stuff, I think we should probably also be able to figure out a way to robotically melt the phenol. You know, I don't think someone with a heat gun is necessarily the best solution here, especially if there's some precedent for the phenol burping up onto people. I think uh, that's probably an indicator that we need to do something about that. In the cell culture lab of our university, someone messed up and mislabeled a few bottles of anhydrous ethanol and concentrated hydrochloric acid solution. These are used at different points in the media preparation. Media is just what biologists grow stuff on. Like, it's frequently called growth medium. This mislabeling resulted in a student accidentally adding ethanol to their HCL on a hot plate. This immediately resulted in the formation of ethyl chloride, an anesthetic gas that quickly filled the small lab room and required the entire lab to be shut down and ventilated for about two hours before they would let anyone back in. I would imagine whatever tech refilled the stocks for media prep was either heavily disciplined or fired. No one got hurt, but I had to restart the entire process the next day as they made everyone discard our media and all stock was replaced fresh. To be specific, the HCL is used to help balance the media pH and we add lye and distilled water to the HCL and media solution until we get to a pH of 6.58. The ethanol is supposed to be used to sterilize the petri dishes before pouring in the hot fresh media. The students media started bubbling and we all got the heck out of there as that was not at all what should be happening from simply adding more HCL and the alcohol scent quickly filled the space. 
So I looked into this a little bit, and ethyl chloride is actually quite toxic at high doses, and at lower levels of exposure, it has similar effects to diethyl ether. I don't know what those effects necessarily are, but ethyl chloride looks like it could also be carcinogenic, which is not that great. I'm glad to hear that nobody got hurt. Today's Yikes Awardee is Francisco, fake last name. The first story reminded me of my high school chem teacher. He lit several kids on fire, not all at once, it was over the course of years, and it was a lot more than several. For whatever reason, they just couldn't fire him, which honestly, I'm glad they didn't, because he was actually a great teacher and solidified my interest in chemistry. But still, he was wild. It's ironic. Fire a guy and he teaches for a day. Let that guy set kids on fire and he can teach for the rest of his life. Regarding the accumulated mercury story, here at the university in Karlsruhe, apparently the same thing happened. Before they had glove boxes, chemistry under inert gas was executed in boxes with the opening dumped into a bath of mercury. So you could just reach your arms through the mercury and do your chemistry without having to worry about air contamination. So they had large quantities of mercury in the lab and any spilled mercury would seek its way through the cracks in the wooden floor to leave a big surprise for the construction crew when the building was renovated eventually. I really don't envy chemists back then. I'd love to see what this actually looks like because it's hard for me to imagine how you could put your arms through mercury and then still manipulate chemicals. Plus I imagine if you're putting your arms through mercury that's probably going to cut off your circulation and I can't imagine that's going to be too good for your effective manipulation of chemicals. This is today's big story. Not specifically a chemistry story, but definitely a hazardous substance and common sense lesson. My coworkers and I were doing first aid training provided by the Canadian Red Cross. In the training, we are taught how to use epinephrine injectors, EpiPens, to help someone who's having a severe allergic reaction. They used to use dummy training injectors, no needle or medicine, obviously, and everyone would mime taking off the cap and sticking it into their arm. The instructor also happened to have an allergy, so they carried their own real EpiPen in their bag. They had a pretty funny story to tell of a past session where they left their bag in front of a trainee while they were doing this exercise. The trainee, maybe they didn't have a dummy one, reached into the bag, took out the trainer's real EpiPen and stuck it into her arm. Somehow, the very real needle injecting very real liquid into her arm was not concerning to her, so she proceeded to calmly rub the injection site as instructed to help the medicine absorb into the body. Needless to say, the instructor flipped out and the lady had to be taken to the hospital, her heart probably flooring it the whole time. She made a recovery, and my instructor ended the story by telling us that the woman's nickname in her workplace is now Epi. That's epic. We also have this comment from another user. A fun side effect of epinephrine can be chills or other temperature irregularity at the injection site. So not only was their heart going crazy, but they probably had a weirdly cold arm the trip there, lol. My mom was disposing of my sister's old EpiPens once, and by some stroke of misfortune accidentally stuck herself in the finger with one. Later that night, her hand was unreasonably cold to the point that she couldn't sleep, and it didn't matter how deep under her blankets she put her hand, it would still be cold. The next day, she put two and two together and realized that those two events were correlated. That's really awful, and the fact that your sister's needle went into your mom's arm is a very uncomfortable story. Yikes. Despite working in a lab and using needles to manipulate chemicals, I am still terrified of needles. Not my stories, but I thought it would fit here, since they touch on something incredibly dangerous, yet often not talked about. High pressure liquids coming out of a small opening. Because at high pressures and small surface area of the liquid, due to coming from a small opening, it essentially acts like a needle, penetrating skin and settling itself into your tissue once it slows down. Jet injectors work exactly via this mechanism. Here are a few stories that I found in other comment sections on the matter. A guy I worked with had a high pressure sprayer loaded with trichlor to clean it out. Trichlor is trichloroisocyanuric acid, this is like the pucks that you have in a pool to chlorinate the water. He squeezed the trigger and couldn't see anything, so he ran one finger in front of the nozzle to check. It was spraying a stream so fine and so hard that it pierced his finger to the bone and filled his hand internally with trichlor. It was a horrific mess and there were surgical amputations. Gary Overman, what would happen if you swiped the water jet? A buddy of mine had hydraulic fluid get forced into his hand under high pressure. They had to slice his finger open to the bone and leave it open for a few days while cleaning it because the fluid blew it up like a balloon. The injection site was at the base of his finger, but it traveled around. He still got a really nasty scar and not much mobility in his finger. Isaac Schaefer, what would happen if you swiped the water jet? Your stories about the air bubble in the veins thing reminded me of when I worked in the seismic oil search in the late 70s. The vibrator trucks, used to send sound waves into the earth, ran an extremely high PSI hydraulic system, and we were always warned never to put our hands anywhere near the hydraulic lines when they were running. Tales were told of mechanics that received blood poisoning from pinhole leaks that forced oil under the skin as they were running their hand along the hoses. I'm unsure if the tales were true, but I erred on the side of caution. Brad Griffin, Ballistic Gel vs. 60,000 PSI Water Jet these are all really scary stories, and while water jets have a lot of utility and they're really interesting, they can be quite terrifying. There's this one really great YouTube channel, Fireball Tool. If you're interested in tools and how tools are designed, I'd encourage you to check it out. This is not sponsored, but it's a really cool channel that I think normally only appeals to an older audience, and I find myself super interested in how tools are manufactured. 
There is literally no way this could go wrong. My friend, seconds before the sounds of shattering glass. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I hope you have a great day.